Bible Read Along, committed to developing Christ-centered, Bible-based, Spirit-filled believers who love God, love His Word, and love sharing it with others. BibleReadalong.com Good Biblical Morning! Yeah! Welcome back to, or maybe welcome for the first time, Bible Read Along, Bible, read along, a hey, Bible, read along, yeah, Bible, read along. I hope you'll share it with a friend. Yeah! Um, but welcome, welcome to Bible Read Along. Today we are looking at 2 Kings chapter 9. We are live on time, at the regular time, with the regular crew. I'm here, my name is Daniel, I love Jesus, he's changed my life. I'm here with my wife, Ashley. She's right behind the cameras. Um, she loves Jesus, too. And she loves me. And I love her. Aww. And we love the Bible. Yeah. Yay! Um, so what do we do here? We take about 30 minutes. Read a chapter of Scripture. Today is 2 Kings chapter 9. We dig into it, try to understand the context, the history, and then also look at things that could apply to us as well. And so I encourage you, grab a Bible. We use the Celebrate Recovery Bible. We are reading from the NIV version. Read along. Grab a pen. Grab a highlighter. I encourage you to do that as well. It's good to mark up your Bible. Take notes. Put it in there. Um, highlighters I recommend Sharpie gel not a sponsor but I sure I like you these your voice to like announce the Sharpie gel it's a highlighter that goes on like a crayon it it's amazing it won't bleed through your pages in your Bible um, so that's what I like the Sharpie gel I do change my voice don't I <laughs> um, but not a sponsor not yet but if anyone works with Sharpie that would like to get in touch with me, I would love to promo your highlighters every single morning. So let's go say hello to who's on Facebook. If you're in TikTok land here, I see you coming in and out. And I, I know that you're there watching as you're scrolling through. Stop for a minute. Say hi. Just say hi. Tell us that you're here. Let's go see who's on Facebook. We have Matthew Baker. He's watching in Vernon, BC. He's on holidays. Nice. Um, Ashley's in there. Oh, I'm moving the wrong thing here. Ashley's in there. Mercury, good morning. Everyone's here today. We are all here today. And I keep moving the wrong thing. There we go. I change my voice when I want something. Oh. Uh, why are it's you being... When I go thrift shopping. Why are you being silly? Grab a pen, grab a highlighter, and grab a friend. And don't forget to share Bible read along out, Mercury says. Mm -hmm. Very good. Matthew asked, how are my lungs? Um, honestly, Matthew, it's day to day. Still, still just kind of taking it one day at a time. Um, some days I'm going without puffers. Some days I need the buffers. Some days I can barely breathe. Some days I'm fine. It, I really don't know what's happening with my lungs. So let's pray and get into the Bible today. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you, God, for life and the gift you've given us today. Thank you. Lord, use this time, use this community, and use your word to transform us, that we would be Bible-based, Christ-centered, spirit-filled Christians in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Second Kings chapter 9. If you're ready, here's what we do. Maybe you're new to this and you don't know. If you're on TikTok and you're ready for the word of God, hit that heart. If you're ready on Facebook, hit that thumbs up and type in the chat. I'm ready. Bless you. Type in the chat. I'm ready. Here we go. Second Kings chapter nine. So we'll just dive right in, I think. The prophet Jehu anointed king of Israel. Now we've heard the name Jehu before. He actually started to make an appearance at the end of 1 Kings. Um, but now we get into the story of Jehu. So this is going to be good. It's going to be good. Jehu anointed king of Israel. The prophet Elisha summoned a man from the company of the prophets and said to him, 
Tuck your cloak into your belt. Take this flask of olive oil with you and go to Ramoth Gilead. <coughs> Excuse me. When you get there, look for Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat. He was Jehoshaphat was also king, his son Jehu. Jehoshaphat was a godly king. He obeyed God, did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. His son Jehu, the son of Nimshi, go to him. Get him away from his companions and take him into an inner room. Then take the flask, pour the oil on his head and declare, This is what the Lord says. I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and run. Don't delay. So the young prophet went to Ramoth Gilead. When he arrived, he found the army officers sitting together. I have a message for you, commander, he said. For which one of us? asked Jehu. For you, commander, he said. Jehu got up with him, went into the house. The prophet poured the oil on Jehu's head and declared, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anoint you king over the Lord's people. You are to destroy the house of Ahab, your master, and I will avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the Lord's servants shed by Jezebel. The whole house of Ahab will perish. I will cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free. I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam. Now they always relate things back to Jeroboam. Why? Because Jeroboam was the most wicked king at this time in Israel's history. So they always go, you know, they did, he went the way of Jeroboam, evil. Um, Jehu, though, Jehoshaphat, doing the things of God. I will make this the house of Ahab. Ahab was king and married to Jezebel. They were killing all the prophets. This was back when Elijah was there and the fire came down, consumed the, the offering. We've read some of this story as well. If you missed those videos, they're available. Go back. They're available on our Facebook and YouTube, or you could listen to them on podcast. I'll make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebit, and like the house of Basha, son of Ahijah. As for Jezebel, Dogs will devour her on the plot of ground at Jezreel, and no one will bury her. And he opened the door and ran. Now, some of you, or bury her, if, depending how you want to say that word. Um, yes, that's what you were thinking. <laughs> Don't shake your head like it doesn't matter. Um, but here, we've already heard this story. If you've been following along in 1 Kings, 2 Kings, we've already seen this story play out. Now, what is happening, though, is they are now going through the kings. Morning, Andrew. Um, the truth has set me free. They're going through these kings, and they're kind of, this is almost a flashback. It's like they gave the quick overview already, and now they're going into each story in detail. And so this has already happened. Um, but this is now the details of that story. This is, imagine... Um, movies you know sometimes there's a movie and I'll, I'll use i haven't seen them all so i'm probably going to butcher the analogy but um marvel universe with superheroes there's movies like justice league and stuff that have all the overview of them together working together what they did and then there's other movies that have the story of Each aquaman and flash and the, you know tv series and different things that get into the details of those people that's what we're seeing here in the Bible. We see this overview story, and then we're going back into ones in detail. I hope that makes sense. That's why am I telling you that? Because when you're reading the Bible, who's your best friend? Context. So there's not two Jehus. Well, I thought we already heard about Jehu. Is there another Jezebel? Is there another Jehu? Is it? No, it's the same story. It's just being told at a different time. Um. And he ran. When Jehu went out to his fellow officers, one of them asked him, is everything all right? Because now you got to picture what just happened. This guy with his tunic, so they would have wore cloaks, robes, kind of thing, tucked up into his belt. Now, what does that mean? It means he took the tunic from the back, pulled it up through his legs in the front, and then tucked it in. So it looks like a giant diaper. Um, 
That's how they would have ran at that time. So he pulled it through his legs up and tucked it in so that he could run. He runs there, this guy that looks like he's in a giant diaper. And then he says, I have a message for you. For who? For you. Jehu. Jehu. And they go into this inner room. So he leaves all the guards. They go into this inner room. And then um, he dumps oil on him, says, the Lord has said, you're going to be king. You're going to destroy Ahab, Jezebel. You're going to bring desolation to them. And then with his cloak still tucked in, the giant diaper man, he runs out of the room. So this is why the other guards are going, is everything okay? Like, what just happened here? Diaper man came running up. You went with him into a private room. Now Captain you're Underpants. Captain Underpants. Now you're covered in oil. Um, and the kid, we just saw a diaper man. We just actually. saw Captain Underpants run out again, like <laughs> frantically, like a maniac. Like I picture. Um, um, just running in. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> Runs in, dumps it. Bye. I also picture him running a little bit like uh, Captain Jack Sparrow in that, you know, this, he's doing this weird run. And it's like, so they're looking at him like, what the, what, what the what? Um, when Jehu went out to his fellow officers covered in oil, diaper man ran past. One of them asked, is everything all right? Why did this maniac come to you? Here's his reply. You know the man and sort of things he says, Jehu replied. That's not true, they said. Tell us. So he says, oh, you know him. That guy's just a crazy prophet. <laughs> they said, that's not true. Tell us. Jehu said, here is what he told me. This is what the Lord says. I anoint you king over Israel. Two parts of Israel right now. It's a divided kingdom. Israel, Judah. So I anoint you king over Israel. They took they quickly took their cloaks and spread them under him on the bare steps. Then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. Now, what is some of the symbolism here that we see? We see this is this is common. Strip your coats off, you lay them on the ground. When else in scripture do we see this? Give you a moment to think about it. And they're announcing king. They ripped coats off. They actually used palm branches. They laid them down in front of Jesus. In front of Jesus. Jesus. King. You, you, so you knew the answer. <laughs> Jesus. Sorry. You know, it's like one of those Sunday school questions where the answer is always like, if you answer Jesus, you're probably gonna get it mostly right. Um okay. Jesus, yay! <laughs> um, but it is King Jesus. So we see in history. It was normal for them to strip down and lay down their coats. Now, they did this with Jesus when he came into um, into Israel as well, into is it Bethlehem. I can't remember the city name right now, but he came in. They stripped their coats. They waved and they said, Hosanna, Hosanna, King Jesus. And now three days later, they crucified him. But this is what they said, right? So so we see this in it, when people come and go, oh, they weren't declaring him king. And they people don't understand the context of the Bible because this is what they traditionally would do for kings. Mm -hmm. Take off their rope, put it on the ground, on the dirt, on the mud, on the dung, on the feces, on the things that have come that's on the ground. Animals, wild animals and people and this is what they would do because they wanted to elevate the king and show respect. And it's also a way, like there's many forms to this, showing that he's king, showing they're a servant, um, you know, raising up the king by lowering themselves kind of thing. So this is what we see. And this happened to Jesus as well. Why is that maybe important? Because sometimes when there's these parallels, what was Jehu called to do? He was called to rise up to destroy evil and the spirit Jezebel. And Jezebel was killing, which was really, let's put it into these terms, antichrist spirit. Anything she was against God, against God's people, she was against the assembly of them. So this is a picture, Jehu is a symbol, a picture of Jesus to come. That the, the robes will be thrown down, that he will rise up as king, that he will destroy evil. That he will remove and break the anti-Christ, anti-God spirit. So there's there's symbols in here that we see all the time. And when the more you know your Bible, the more you pick up on those things. 
because that and then the, the more layers you go and you see maybe you've never heard that is this brand new to you have you ever even thought that before nope. when you see these parallels jesus did this happen to jesus does this point to jesus everything in scripture points to jesus so excuse me jehu son of jehoshaphat the son of nimshi conspired against joram um this is also Jorim has also been called, it's probably down here in this context, uh, Jehoram. So we've heard this, this king's name before as well. Now, Jorim and all Israel had been defending Ramoth Gilead against Haziel, king of Aram. We've read that story as well. But King Joram had returned to Jezreel to recover from the wounds the Arameans had afflicted on him in battle with Hazil, king of Aram. So we actually just read that yesterday. Jehu said, If you desire to make me king, don't let anyone slip out of the city to go and tell the news in Jezreel. Then he got his chariot and rode to Jezreel. Because Jeho, Jero, Joram, Jehoram um, was resting there and Ahaziah, king of Judah, had gone down to see him. When the lockout, sorry, when the lookout standing on the tower in Jezreel saw Jehu's troops approaching, he called out, I see troops coming in. Get a horseman, Joram ordered. Send him to meet them and ask, do you come in peace? So again, we're seeing this. There's wars going on. There's battles going on. A crazy diaper man, the prophet comes in and anoints. And that, that's an interesting message too with the prophet coming in, but because it wasn't his own prophetic message. It was given to Elisha, the prophet. And then he said, here's the prophetic word. And somebody else carried it forward. This is discipleship. Sometimes we're so busy going, God, give me a word. Well, are you even being faithful with the word God has given someone else? Are you passing it forward? This is how Christianity is to work. I receive salvation. I pass the message forward to others and lead them to salvation. So anyways, he came running in, anoints him with oil. The guards are like, okay, you're king. We'll lay down our robes. They, they start rising up. He says, get to Jezreel, the city of Jezreel. And he starts riding the city of Jezreel. The army's looking because there's war going on. They see someone riding in with their, their troops and say, okay, send a horseman and find out, does he go in peace? Verse 18. The horseman rode off to meet Jehu and said, This is what the king says. I speak on behalf of someone else. The message I've heard, I now am faithful to carry it forward to someone else. Do you come in peace? What do you have to do with peace? Jehu replied. Fall in behind me. The lookout reported, The messenger has reached them, but he isn't coming back. So the king sent out a second horseman. When he came to them, he said, this is what the king says. Do you come in peace? Jehu replied, what do you have to do with peace? Fall in behind me. This is, this is kind of interesting too. And there's probably some parallels to Jesus here as well. You know, hey, fisherman, do you want to be a fisher of men? Instead, you want to be a real fisherman? Come follow me. Hey, do you he think... He must have had some authority in his voice just to say those words, and then the messengers just did it. Yes. So there is an authority here. They also know um, on the battlefield, like, really, there's two options now. If this, if this approaching army isn't going to talk to them, they either become a slave or they become dead. <laughs> and so it's like... I'm here. I'm, what do you have to do with peace? You guys are at war. You're fighting. Everything you do is about war. You want peace? Get behind me. So I don't know if this is a you've just become my slave or if this is more of a choose to be with me. Whose side are you going to fight on here? Um, the lookout reported. He reached him, but he isn't coming back either. They're confused. They don't know what's happening. They go to meet the king and suddenly they're the falling behind Jehu. The driver is like that of Jehu, son of Nimshi. So they're getting close enough that now they can go. I see that he's, it's Jehu. It looks like it could be Jehu. And he drives like a maniac. Daniel, you mean. 
Like Daniel. Hitch up my chariot, Joram ordered. And when it was hitched up, Joram, Jehoram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, rode out. There's the two kingdoms. Now remember, they had come together, Judah and Israel, to help defend against the Arameans. This is the war that's going on right now. They've teamed up. They're fighting against others. Um, and actually, I think they had teamed up with the Arameans to fight off the Hittites. Um, they met him at the plot of ground that belonged to Naboth the Jezreelite. When Joram saw Jehu, he asked, Have you come in peace, Jehu? Jehu replies, How can there be peace as long as all this idolatry and witchcraft of your mother Jezebel abound? Now remember, these kings, there's prophetic words that came to them too. They came together because the prophet came and said, Hey, you guys need to work together to fight outside of this or you're all going to be dead. Um, so that's why they have this little alliance right now anyways. Joram turned about and fled, calling out to Ahaziah, Treachery, Ahaziah. In other words, treason, They're, these guys are coming against us. Then Jehu drew his bow and shot. And this was a pretty clear message from Jehu. Like, hey, you say you're coming. You're asking about peace. There will never be peace in our land as long as you guys are king and serving false gods. I'm here to change that. Mm -hmm. You see the power and the anointing that has now come on Jehu. Now, this is probably something that was in him already. Jehoshaphat was a godly king. So there's probably things already in him. And when the anointing came on him, though, the call that was with inside of him was empowered and said, okay, it's now time to push God's agenda. Timing is so critical. God has placed things inside of you and inside of me. And I am guilty sometimes of trying to rush the things of God. We wait till his timing. Wait till there's been an anointing recognized by someone else. That doesn't mean don't do anything. Jehu was still captain of the guard. He was still running the, you know, the armies. He was doing things already. But when the anointing came, it took it to another level. Jehu drew his bow and shot Joram between the shoulders in the back as he turned to run, shot him. The arrow pierced his heart and he slumped down in his chariot. Jehu said to Bidka, the chariot officer, pick him up, throw him on the field that belonged to Naboth the Jezreelite. Remember how you and I were riding together in chariots behind Ahab his father when the Lord spoke this prophecy against him. Yesterday I saw the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, declares the Lord, and I will surely make you pay, for it is on this plot of ground, declares the Lord. Now then, pick him up and throw him on that plot in accordance with the word of the Lord. So in other words, again, a prophetic word had already come and said, and that's in, uh, that prophecy is in 1 Kings 21. Um, they had already... The word had already come and said, on this field, there's going to be bloodshed of these kings, including King Joram, which we just saw died, and they throw him on the field, fulfilling the prophecy. When Ahaziah, king of Judah, saw what happened, he fled up the road to Beth Hagen. He'd be running. Jehu chased him, shouting, kill him too. They wounded him in his chariot on the way up to the gear, the that's a weird word, up to Gur near Iblium. But he escaped to Megiddo and died there. He took, his servants took him by chariot to Jerusalem and buried him with his ancestors in the tomb of the city of David. In the 11th year of Joram, son of Ahab, Ahaziah had become king of Judah. Again, some of the history, the context. Jezebel killed. Here we go. Final little portion here. Stick with me. Happen. Stick with me. I wonder what's going to happen. Then Jehu went up to Jezreel. When Jezebel heard about it, she put on eye makeup. <laughs> I need to get ready. <laughs> Arranged her hair and looked out a window. As Jehu entered the gate, she asked, Have you come in peace? You, Zimri, you murderer of your master. Um, I don't know what Zimri means. Was there 
peace for Zimri who murdered his master. Um, so this is referring to something, a history as well. I don't know what Zimri is off the top of my head. It's a person. It's a person. Um, and interesting here, Jezebel, what do we see in Jezebel? We see that she's often more concerned about outward appearance than inward struggles. Um, and we have to remember there's two different things in the Bible. There's the person of Jezebel. Then there is also what the Bible refers to as the spirit of Jezebel. Um, and that's referred to in Galatians and Ephesians. And so there's things from the person of Jezebel that actually relate to the spirit of Jezebel. One of them being that we just saw here. She cares more about outward appearance than inward. Wars coming, people are being killed, you know, and she's more worried about her makeup and her hair. He looked up at the wind, and that doesn't mean makeup and hair is bad. That's not, don't take this to an extreme. That's not what this means. It it means where is your priorities? You my know? priorities is in my eyebrows. Yoga. So if your priority in time of trouble and war is more concerned with how do I look than what's going on in the nation, what's going on in our hearts, what's there, there's something out of line there. That needs to be challenged. Verse 32. We're in 2 Kings 9 verse 32. He looked up at the window and called out. Who is on my side? Who? Two or three eunuchs looked down at him. Throw her down, Jehu said. So they threw her down. And some of her blood splattered on the wall. As the horse trampled her underfoot. So, you know, the queen saying, you're evil and you're, you're a murderer, you. And he looks up at the, at the wall and says, who's with me? And he sees some eunuchs that look out the window and he says, he commands them. Remember, people are just falling in line. I've come to bring peace. Either you're with me or you're in trouble right now. It's, this is death or life. Um, throw her down. So they did. They threw Queen Jezebel off the palace. Then the... the horses run her over jehu went in and ate and drank in the palace take care of that cursed woman he said and bury her for she was a king's daughter so in other words we still are going to show her respect because of her position not because of who she was andrew filled me in here zimri killed a king and only lasted one week thank you i know we've read it but it just did not click what he was um Sorry, was, I just looked it up. Was he, the, was he the one that... Fifth king of Israel. Fifth king of Israel. He killed the king like it was like a mutiny. He stabbed him in the back or something. Is that right, Andrew? Let me know. Um, if you're on TikTok right now, make sure you follow The Truth Set Me Free. Amazing guy. Great, great Bible info, trivia. Go follow him. Okay. Let's keep going here. They threw her down. The horse trampled. Verse 34, Jehu went in and drank and ate. Take care of that cursed woman. Bury her for she was a king's daughter. We're showing her respect because of position, not because of who she is. But so we, you know, Jezebel was an evil, evil woman, but she still was queen. So we're going to treat her with respect. Is there maybe a message here about how to treat politicians, leaders today? Maybe. All right. But. You don't have to always agree with them, but we honor a position. We pray for those in authority. Okay. When they went out to bury her, they found nothing except her skull, her feet, and her hands. They went back and told Jehu, who said this, This is the word of the Lord that he spoke through his servant Elijah the Tishbite. On the plot of ground at Jezreel, dogs will devour Jezebel's flesh. And that prophecy is found in 1 Kings 21 as well. Um, Jezebel's body will be like dung on the ground in the plot of Jezreel so that no one will be able to say, this is Jezebel. And that prophecy came to pass too. Dogs came and ate her entire body except for her hands, feet, and skull. And she was left there to die. So all of the word came to pass. So that was today's chapter. What stood out to you? Um, I think there's a few things for me. Um, and yes, 
Andrew said he was the he was the fifth king of Israel. Two points for Daniel. Betrayed the previous king, his master. Yeah. Um, thank you, Ashley, for also looking that up. So what was in this chapter? Yeah, two points for Daniel. <laughs> One point for Ashley, my assistant. Okay. Um, but what what stood out? What was in this chapter? If you got questions on Facebook, put them in. You got questions on TikTok, put them in. Um, to me, there's a few things. Jehu was anointed king. Um, sometimes prophets act crazy. You know, diaper man came running in, dumped oil, came, went running away like, maybe like Jack Sparrow, maybe not. That's poetic license. Um, <laughs> you know, you do that. he went running away. Um, so that's one story that took place. But then what do we see? As soon as that anointing came, Jehu's fellow servants and friends laid down their coats. They recognize him as king. This could be symbolism of Jesus Christ. They laid down the palm branches and coats and recognized him as king. Jehu's mission was to go and destroy wickedness and evil in the earth. The spirit of Jezebel, which is an anti-God, anti-Christ spirit. Jesus Christ was sent to destroy the deeds of darkness that the world had been under for so long because of the sin of Adam and Eve. And so we see some symbolism there. We see prophets being faithful with the word of God given to them by someone else. Even when they didn't receive their own word from God, they received from men and women of God. In this chapter, men, they received from men of God and then carry that message with authority and anointing. Um, we see prophecies fulfilled. Je Jehu comes and he just says, look, I'm here. I'm here. There won't be peace as long as you're serving false gods. So I'm here to clean house. Here's what I'm called to do. The prophecies were fulfilled. Um, we see a bit of name calling. We see authority. Jehu saying, follow in line. If you really want peace, get behind me. They did. We see um, Jezebel killed. We see Ahab. We see Joram. We see um, all of these things take place in this chapter. What do you see? What stood out to you? Anything you can relate to? Let's go to our Facebook group. Again, this is kind of it for today. Thank you for being here. If you haven't already, please go check out our website. Um, Lots of all our videos are available there and so much more, including the free prayer course. And I know Andrew and others have taken this course that are maybe watching today. I, I really am feeling a time again that we're going to push the prayer course a little bit more. So if anybody wants it, it's available for free. Go and check it out. Oops, I turned my massager up. I got the massager on my back. Help me out this morning. Okay. Facebook. We're ready. We're ready. All right. What was the prophet's name? The prophet that spoke was Elisha. We don't know the servant that spoke for him. Um, yes, Mercury. So like Genesis 1 was an overview and Genesis 1 and 2, and then it gets into the details. Yes, absolutely. And this is quite often a Hebrew style of writing. Give the big picture, give the smaller pictures. Um, <laughs> Andrew can relate to needing his w a wife's help. Me too, as you could see clearly. Um, so that's good, Trish. My lungs, grab a pen. I'm ready. Where are we here? Why did Jehu kill Joram and Ahaziah? Um, the very basic thing is in that we read in the chapter... They worshipped false gods, and that was the biggest crime. They turned from the Lord towards other people. Lisa, I'm late, but I'm here. Good morning. We are always glad you're here. Why were they doing witchcraft in the Bible, Dan? Um, well, in witchcraft here, I mean, doesn't just mean sorcery and these kind of things. They were serving false gods. Why did they do that? Because they think they had better wisdom, better understanding. We still do this today. We know God. 
We could serve God, but instead we turn to do things in our own strength. Or we go, well, I'll just trust the government. I'll trust the doctor. I'll trust more than I trust God. It's not bad to trust those things, but it's wrong to put them in a place above God. We'll put other things in place of God. Recreation, fun. Well, I know I should be in church, but it's summer and I just want to be on the boat every weekend. And I want to, and we place things above God. And there's, there's caution and warning in this. Um, you know, is it the same as the old Testament? No, but there's a caution and a warning. It will, it will suck the life away from you. Instead of Jesus coming to fulfill, to, to give life and life abundantly, that life that you could have will be taken away. Now that doesn't mean you're going to die, but it means the fullness of life you could have had. You're not going to reach that if you're serving false gods, worshiping false things. Um, I'll be glad when the names are normal again. Yes, the names, Lisa, can be a little bit hard. Um, even for me, and I've read these several times, but the names are hard. Um, don't get caught so much in the names. Sometimes I mentally have to go, okay, bad king, good king, Jehu, good. This guy that they killed, bad. Okay, and I kind of have to sometimes do that sometimes. Lynn, good morning, Lynn. When does the prayer course start? I'm not sure yet. I'm, I'm just feeling I need to get it going again. So here's what I would like to do in a perfect world. If you have people that you are friends with, if you have Bible study group that would like to do it, if you have, you know, maybe there's even people in your church that would like to do it. Um, I would like to organize times where we do this by Zoom. We show the video, I interact and talk, and then we'll talk about the 30-day prayer challenge and stuff too. But it's free. We just want to train people how to pray. We need prayer more than ever. Um, <laughs> Mercury, so does that mean we will be rewarded if we obey? Um, you love coming back to that one. Um <sighs> Uh, let me say it this way. You've been, I don't want to just be saved. Salvation's amazing. And if that's all I ever receive from God, he deserves all praise, glory, and honor forever and ever. Amen. However, I believe God actually has greater things for us, even on earth in this short, quick life that, that come through connection with him. Blessings. Um, but jobs, authority, you know, um, things that purposes to fulfill. And I would hate for me to not, I'd hate to get to heaven and go, yay, I'm saved. I made it, but I didn't do all the things God had called me to do. I didn't enjoy life. Boy, I made it, but man, I was still angry and bitter and unforgiving and God's work didn't have a work in me that freed me of those things. So I, when, I, when I'm saying this, it doesn't mean that we get rewarded if we obey. But there is, obedience does bring greater blessing. So if my kids are, I'm trying to think of just a good scenario. If they're left home, they're at an age where they could be left home alone. And I say, hey, I love you guys no matter what. Now I come home and there's dishes all over the counter. The floor is a mess. Things, maybe something's broken. I'm going to come and go, oh, I still love them just as much. But, you were talking about me. no, uh -uh. no, um, you know, I still love them as much. But if I came home and dishes were done and things were cleaned and this kind of thing to my kids, is there a reward for that? Yes. Did they do it to reward? Maybe, you know, maybe there is, but there's definitely more trust to leave them alone again. There's more trust to give them more responsibility. Um, and I, and I don't know if, if this kind of is a good analogy of that, but that's how I see our life with God. When, when we are doing what he's asked us to say, there's greater trust given to us greater jobs given to us greater purpose given to us i hope that answers the question um 
I think for me, there is reward in doing good. I'm going to just say that there is reward in doing good. Um, where we get into trouble is if we base our salvation off of what we've done or good things. So this is not the rewards I'm talking about are not salvation. Salvation is given by God. We receive it by faith. It's given through his grace received by faith. I believe and I'm saved. That's it. Now, once we are saved, we enter into a process of sanctification, being changed, being renewed, being made whole. And so um, that's what I see more in scripture than us being rewarded for doing good. But there are rewards for doing good as an employee. If I'm a good employee, there are different benefits to that. If my my job does well, my yard does well, they get they receive a bigger bonus. They receive these yeah, Ashley cleans houses. Now, they've already paid for her to clean the house. But if she does really well and they trust her and they like her, they often will give more of a tip or they will give more jobs for her to do. They'll refer her and they, you know, and so I think there is there is this in life and there is this with God as well. Is it for our salvation? No, 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 no. And that's where I want to be clear. We don't do good works to get saved. And we don't do good works to keep our salvation. We do good and receive blessing or reward because that's just the nature of it. That's, the, that's how it works. It has nothing to do with us being saved or not. I hope that maybe makes sense. Maybe we'll talk more about that on our TikTok. We'll see. We're going to end for now on Facebook. Thank you guys for being here. I will get you more info. If you're interested in the prayer course, go to our website. And on there is, I believe it says, contact me. Let me just look it up here real quick. BibleReadalong.com If you go to BibleReadalong.com and you go to contact, I believe that's the one, go to contact, um, thank you, Andrew says he loves the books, he got some of the journals and the prayer, the 30 day prayer challenge, um, if you go to contact us, you can put in your email and that actually adds you to my email list. And then when we start to announce the prayer course again, you will be the first ones notified and you get rewarded. So you do good, you get rewards, right? Um, so if you join the email list, you actually get different deals and things that are coming up. You get access to exclusive things that are only available to those joining on email. So check that out, BibleReadAlong.com, contact. That's it for today on Facebook. God bless. Thank you for being here. Please make sure, hit that heart, hit that thumbs up. Um, share this with others, invite them to join the group. And we just want to keep seeing this grow and reach as many people to be Bible-based, Christ-centered, spirit-filled Christians for as long as possible. God bless. Bible Read Along, committed to developing Christ-centered, Bible-based, spirit-filled believers who love God, love His Word, and love sharing it with others. BibleReadalong.com